Welcome to episode 62 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have the only British player to have been drafted in the last decade. Ryan Richards, obviously picked by the San Antonio Spurs in the 2010 NBA draft. And someone who uh, my story has been very closely aligned with because he was one of the first players that um, I covered in a lot of depth and kind of also gave uh, the, the Hoops Fix website uh, a, a bit of attention internationally as well. Uh, kind of rode on, rode on his coattails a little bit. So it's been fascinating to kind of watch his journey from from then through until now as a, as a young 19-year-old getting drafted into the NBA and then kind of seeing t- all of the countries that he's that he's li- lived in and, and played in over the last uh, decade, the experiences that he's had. You know, he's played for, I think, over 23, 24 teams, uh, possibly more than that in that time. Um, so just an incredible incredible wealth of experience to share and talk about. And you can really hear that he wants to give back and um, be as open and honest as possible to provide that advice to the younger players coming through and maybe a little bit more guidance guidance that he wasn't able to get himself uh, when he was coming up so this actually I think was one of the most open vulnerable um, enjoyable conversations um, podcasts I've done in recent times uh, for sure anyway before we get into the show please take two seconds to go and check out our patreon account p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x as you know uh, the work that we're doing it is not free it does cost money uh, and we cannot do it without the help and support of our audience um, there you can sign up to give us a monthly donation or as much or as little as you'd like to help us doing the work that we're doing please go and check it out patreon.com forward slash hoops fix as always if you're listening on itunes please take two seconds to give us a rating and review if you're watching on youtube leave a comment below let us know what you think about uh, what ryan has to say uh, like subscribe all of that uh, awesome stuff and then finally if you want to reach out to me uh, i'm available on every single social media platform at hoops fix or if you want to uh, reach out to me in private uh, on my email address sam at hoops i reply to every single one anyway uh, that is enough from me here is this week's show with ryan richards ryan welcome to the show thank you as we were saying uh before we start recording actually you were the first podcast i did before i had a podcast um because we had that recording almost 10 years ago which I was in a dingy little place in Maryland uh, recording the phone recording on my computer. I had some messed up tech set up. Um, But that was uh, around the time that obviously you got drafted. And I mean, it's crazy now to think about all the time that's passed, uh, what you've done since then um, and everything that's changed. So it'll be a great opportunity to kind of bring you on here and and go back to the beginning and talk about kind of your career to date and kind of how how are you feeling about it and how how it's all going. Um, I guess starting with just the present day, uh, you are in yeah. uh, Belgium. Um, is it Belgium? Yeah, it's Belgium. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. So you've just signed. Can you kind of talk about kind of where you signed and how how that this uh, sort of thought process uh, decision was was made? Well, you know, now I'm a little bit older, um, and again looking for some security for myself, uh, just to kind of settle down. I know Belgium is close to home, real close to Kent, especially. Um, new coach. We had some really good conversations. He understands my game. Uh, what I can do, what I can't do. And, you know, I'm excited to, to uh, you know, say come back to Europe. You know, I'm always in and out and here and there, but I'm excited to stay and build something and the team want to get back in the FIBA Euro Cup. So hopefully I can be a part of that and and some stability. So I'm excited to be here. Some really good guys. We've been, you know, with eight weeks before preseason um, and we're in the gym, you know, together getting after it. So I'm excited for uh, what's going to come. How how are they being affected by COVID uh, over there? Well, so far there's no signs that there's going to be a second wave. But as you know, nobody does know. You know, we all just hope and uh, and we go from there. But the league is set to start October second. Preseason is set to start August twelfth, and it's all go ahead at the moment. Um, bars are open, restaurants are open, um, the mask rules in place. But um, it's will, you be, pretty... will you be allowed to play with fans? That's what we're waiting to hear. So at the moment, we're waiting to hear about that. Um, but I think that's what kind of affected a lot of the budgets, you know, like globally, like the whole market, for example. Um, I spent a lot of my time in Iran, in the Middle East, um, which isn't as much stability. Um, but, you know, salaries are hit. A lot of players are being hit by that. And it's making you look at life after basketball and how to set yourself up because, I mean, no one could have guessed this could happen. And uh, it's, it's, it's an eye-opener. 
I was going to say, talk, talking about life after bas- basketball, uh, you obviously did a few years ago a reveal. Was it a few years ago? Well, a year, year or two ago, uh, kind of reveal your stake in uh, your own club uh, in Kent. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're a very, very proud uh, Kent boy. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about kind of, uh, yeah, the Kent Panthers and sort of how, how that came about and kind of what your vision is, I guess? Well, you know, for me, I, um, I've been in so many... I mean, I've been around, I've been in, I was in the Spurs for a whole year. I was in the EuroLeague for a season. I've been in the Euro Cup. From a, I've been everywhere, you know, all over the world to play basketball in all different types of levels. Um, and to be able to give all of that the way I want to give it, um, you know, excites me. And that's why we kind of put the, together the Kent Panthers with Lee and Martin, uh, myself, because there are a lot of kids in Kent that, you know, when people think of Kent, you know, they think, oh, everyone's, you know, well off and, you know, they're rich down there and it's boring. It's countryside, ale, strawberries. But there's a lot of, you know, poverty and bad parts of Kent and kids that, like myself, we don't have anything to look to. You know, a lot of kids in London, they have players that have done it before them. Uh, they have courts everywhere. I think maybe there's a handful of courts in the whole of Kent. And Kent's huge. And it's exciting and it's nice to see these kids and give back something. And I don't think they understand the experience that I have. And it's not really, I'm not really doing it to show them this is what I've done. It's to be like, hey, I'm here for you. If you need someone to look to, if you need someone to look up to or have a vision. Because for me, for the youth, if they don't have a vision or someone to look to where they can, com- you know, compare or think I can do that, it's, it's, you, then you start, you know, getting into things you shouldn't. So, um, and we're competitive. You know, obviously we want to compete with the other clubs in Cairn and in England. And, you know, we're starting off. And, and Jesse's his aunt, who was uh, huge in my life, has helped me out to understand a lot of that. And, and we're working on some things together. So um, that's how it came about, I would say. It's just trying to give back, but the way I want it. You know, not so more, not so much uh, pop-ups here and there, but building a family and, and a community. I was going to say, is the focus kind of in this beginning stage much more on the grassroots, sort of just actually getting kids to fall in love with the game at the early age rather than, you know, developing elite talent and focusing on the elite end of the spectrum, the guys yeah. that are already doing it, you know? Yeah, I think for me, it's giving, it's giving kids, you know, something to look forward to it's giving them you know a community a brotherhood um, and if some talent comes out of that you know i've got plenty of contacts and i know people that i can push in that way and and you know we can we can work together but it's more doing it the right way you know building it the right way and giving kids stability and giving them a home in a sense outside of their home and, and that is what we're doing um with the kent pampers and then uh, I saw, obviously, on social, you potentially do it. Well, were you meant to be doing a camp this summer, which I assume didn't happen because of COVID, or was it next summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it was going to be this summer. It was huge. We, I had so many contacts and so many ex-teammates and coaches and people all pulling together to put pull off something that hasn't been done in England the way we wanted to do it. Um, you know, you've got some great camps. When I was a kid, there was Den Camp, which was unbelievable. We still talk about it at this day. Um, in 2000 and six was it or five i think in seven oaks when would that have been 2000 i don't, I don't know the years a long time yeah a long time yeah. But anyway so and then you've got the den cap now which is amazing the top 50 but yeah. um, no we put something really you know really special together but it will be um happening in um 2021 and i'm excited for that so details will be coming out soon on that and okay and uh, that's more so for you know the ballers in the whole of England, and we hope to move it around, you know, to other cities and other areas, and 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 build something that um, the UK, I feel, is missing. You, you're kind of, uh, you know, you've spoken about stability there, and you are obviously, you know, talking about home and, and everything else. You know, you you're what 29 now? You 29? Yeah, 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 yeah tw- 29, 29, 29 now. You kind of got one eye on on the end of your career. How long? How many more years do you reckon you got in, in you playing? Uh, and yeah. then kind of, what do you see? the immediate transition being uh, when you kind of finally hang out the boots? I mean, for me, if uh, you would have asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said, you know, I think I'll be done at maybe 30 because it was just, you know, the athleticism. Um, But with the skill, with the game, the way the game's changed, I feel like I've got really lucky. I feel like when I got drafted, I was a little bit before my time. Like, there wasn't guys... I I think, you know, I would be a top 10 pick in today's draft with my skill set. Um... But back then it was a bit like, ah, you know, we want the big bigs and the threes. And so I think I've kind of got lucky where I can go another 10 years with my skill set. I don't think it's, uh, you know, I was taking care of my body. Who knows? But I am really excited to, uh, to 
make the most of these next. Uh, I actually remember you told me, you know, is enjoy it, enjoy the moment because it goes by so quick. You told me that maybe five, six years ago, I remember. I wish I enjoyed the moments when I was doing them. Now I really want to enjoy the moments and um, and just go from there. But I have no clue. But I am excited to life after basketball. I've done it since I was 14, 15 professionally. That's all, you know, that's all I know. Could I go into an office? Could I um, work in a factory? Could I don't know if I could do those things. So I've done, I've done property and I've done well with that. Um, to set myself up. But I don't know. But I'm really excited to travel the world after basketball to actually travel and do things rather than hotel, gym, uh, city to city for games. But I have no clue. But when I finish is, um, yeah, your, your guess is as good as mine. So we'll see. <laughs> how, how do you find dealing with the with the downtime? It, it took me a few years to suddenly realise, you know, like in the early days when I started Hoops Fix and you know, I was in touch with a few of the sort of GB guys and, and guys coming through. And then they would go away for the season and all of a sudden they would be in contact with me a lot more because all of a sudden they've got all this time on their hands where you literally, you've got your practice and then you've got, yeah. you know, a whole four, five, six hours, or whatever, if you're doing two days, maybe. But otherwise, there is a lot of time outside of your practice and your games. Mm. Kind of, you know, in in the, all your years and kind of all the different countries you've been in, like, are you one of the ones that embraces that uh, each city and goes out and explores and tries to see everything or you more kind of some people prefer to stay in their rooms and just yeah. you know play on the computer or whatever kind of how do you how do you approach uh, sort of your, your time away from Are you talking about, you're talking about off season yeah on off season, season no during drinking, the season yeah, during yeah. the season during the season yeah with me you know I'm, I'm I honestly think I'm probably the greatest Call of Duty player to ever come out of England and I'll put that out there so for me it's, it, there's no question about it. I, I love games I love PlayStation I love to stay home um, I love to enjoy myself. I love to go out. But as far as the sightseeing stuff like that, I've always kind of been like, I'm here, you know, to kill and to, you know, move on or go here or go there. Or yeah. I haven't really embraced a lot of the cities. Vienna is a city that I've embraced and truly love. Um, Tehran, unreal, unreal city. Um, but most places I've been, it's kind of, you know, you get in, you do your work, you go home and relax. And as far as the off season, I mean, it's kind of funny now with everyone putting all their workouts, you know, on social media. It's like the thing to do. But, I mean, we, we've been doing that for 10, 15 years, working out all summer. We just haven't been recording it. But now it's the thing to do. So, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, that's normal. But, you know, you've got to have your balance. I normally, I normally finish the season. I'll go away for like two, three weeks on a holiday, relax, not touch a basketball, just enjoy myself and then get back into it slowly. Um, but yeah, I love uh, I love staying home and, and uh, getting on Call of Duty. That's me. This yeah. season, this this off season, uh, you know, I saw saw on social media there's a big focus on, on dropping some weight, and it looked yeah. like there was some serious progress made. Uh, kind of, can you talk about your your progress this season and, and sort of what came what prompted that focus on uh, on your body? Yeah, so for me, um, I think two. Th- so when I went to Iran, um, I played in Dubai, Bahrain. Um, all the Arab Cups and, you know, a lot of the bigs are bigs, you know, big, bigs. I mean, I've never struggled with strength, but um, the metabolism, you know, it slowed down. It weren't the same as it was, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's, trust me, like anyone listening, it's a thing. And you can see by before and after pictures of me, it's a thing. Um, so, you know, the enjoying yourself, the eating, you've got to find the right balance. Uh, mobility is a huge thing now for me. I wake up every morning, do my mobility stuff. Um, and with my skill set, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have it and be able to, you know, play for many, many more years, I feel. But I just wanted to change. You know, I just wanted to, you know, eat healthier, feel better, um, look after myself um, and just have a longer career. And it is, it, it's right when you go out one, two nights in a row and then it takes a week to get back to normal now. You know, when I was 19... No problem. So it, 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 for me, it was a big thing of I I didn't know how big I was until I was seeing people. They were like, "Bro, you're you're a big boy now," you know. You <laughs> and that's what made me think, "Oh, okay." And then because of I had my shoulder surgery and I missed the season, I wasn't playing. I wasn't really in the gym with guys. So I think that was a big wake up call. Um, and then after that, I just wanted, I wanted to slim down for myself and just to feel better, to move better on my joints, to play longer. And we went down that route. And I went down from, I was 305 
and I got down to 280 and now I'm about 259, 260. So I'm hoping to, wow. I'm hoping to stay around there. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy at this weight. I feel good. You know, people say I try to get to 250 too. I feel like weight, you know, stepping on the scale can be a real distraction and you can kind of lose your, you see that you see the pounds and you think, ah, but I actually feel really good. So I'm happy with my body and what I've done. And, and uh, it wasn't easy, but I'm, I'm happy with it. I was going to say, what was the actual process? Like you work with a trainer, you work with a nutritionist. Like how do you, for, you know, you set your goal on kind of what body weight you want to get to, down to and then working out kind of how you go about that. What was the process? Well, I think because for me, you know, I'm always playing. You know, I'm always playing. There's always jobs there. You know, people always want a big that can do this or do that. And I, I always come across a lot of jobs and that is the hardest thing is the diet. Um, so I really got into my nutrition. I got a meal prep plan and that was huge to me. I mean, I can work out for four or five hours a day. And if I go and eat, you know, uh, a bunch of unnecessary calories, boom, there's no change. If I do meal prep for a week, my body will just completely change. You know, I go from, uh, you know, a pear to a V. So, you know, that's <laughs> so it's just food. It's all food, mate. It's all nutrition. It's, it really is. And, and a lot of people say it. But when you've always eaten what you've wanted and you've eaten out all the time and traveled and had, ah, it's hard, it's hard, you know, I like yeah. to socialize and be around people. So food was the biggest thing for me. As far as working out, I've always known how to train from being a pro from young and of what I need to do. Yeah. And I got a lot of advice and help with mobility stuff that I didn't do too much. Obviously you don't when you're younger, but um, I would say it is, it is, it's the diet. Diet is huge. All right. So early years, let's, let's go back to the start. Yeah. Um, Originally, you were a football player, right? And you didn't really start playing basketball until, you, until your brother kind of put you onto it. Can you kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, sort of rewind us back to the start, uh, kind of your early sort of pre- Premier League aspirations and uh, how, yeah. how that transitioned into, into playing basketball? Well, you know, like most kids in England, you know, we, we love football and it's what we know. And I knew basketball because I was like, oh, you should play basketball because you're really tall. But there wasn't anybody around me you know, that I saw play that I thought, wow. And when my brother came over from Jamaica, uh, I think I was about 12, 11, 12. And that's when and one, you know, and one mixtapes were huge and he had the shorts and he had the hoodies and the slip and slide and all the moves. And I just watched him play once and I just fell in love. I was like, absolutely shocked. Um, practice every day. I had my, uh, my predators, not the real predators, the fake predators. David Beckham's and I had them on and I was out there playing with him and I didn't know what I was doing but I just wanted to beat him and and and, and that was my 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 goal was to beat him one on one and um, we were very different he's 6'3 um, very slim but like cat quick you know get off the floor boom kind of like Sean Marion was the, that was his type of athleticism so even in my time back then I was obviously athletic but we were very different and uh, he took me to a run at in Fanet down in Ramsgate. Quarter, it was called Quarter Deck and I went there and played with some of the men and I think I scored like the first two points and that was it. I was, you know, I was going to NBA and I could tell me any different. And then um, <laughs> next morning, I remember my mum and dad, were, we were playing outside in the morning and they were like, oh, how was he? How did he do? And he was like, he could go to the league. He was, uh, and obviously I couldn't. I, I, I was wearing predators, and I scored one layup in two hours. But he told me that, and that little bit of, you know, belief, whether he believed it or not, that's all I needed. And the, and after that, it took off. And then, um, so and you, then were, the you were how old? I must have been 12, 12 or thirteen, I think. And I was probably, I was probably about six two, I think, about six two, six three. Um, and um, yeah, everywhere we went, I went, you know, we would walk hours to get to a court. There was one by a Ramsgate train station, but we lived kind of on the coast. So it was a bit of a walk. Um, there was a few courts in Broadstairs and, you know, wherever we could find a court or, a, you know, we, we, would, uh, we would take advantage. When did you experience the growth spurt? Or was it even um, a growth spurt? Uh, not really. I kind of grew every summer, but I think maybe when I was maybe... 13, 14, I think I shot up about six inches, six or five inches. Um, because I was always tall, I didn't really notice, you know, um, I always knew I was taller than the kids at school. I always knew I was taller than, you know, my teammates or my, my, you know, my football teammates and stuff. So I didn't really notice it until my uncles, I was around my uncles and my brothers. And then, you know, they were obviously yeah. like, you know, he, he's going to beat us. And then, and then I did by quite a bit. So, yeah. 
you know, I assume that you kind of probably had a uh, quite natural ability from from day one. Um, or maybe maybe yeah. you didn't, but but I would assume sort of looking at you and kind of how you developed, there was some some level of of natural talent there. When yeah. when did uh, you feel that sort of other people started recognizing that you know this kid Ryan, he's got some talent, he's got some skill, and you know he could be really good. Uh, I would say Ashley Hamilton and Joel Freeland because when I went to Gran Canaria, the ACB club, uh, Joel Freeland was there. Um, but, and again, that's one of the hardest people, or hardest workers, you know, um, I've ever been around. You know, a lot of people don't know about Joel. Joel keeps it to himself, um, you know. But I always remember seeing how hard he went, you know, and I always went hard. But I didn't, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what hard it was until I watched how, you know, just tough he was in practice and he was competing every single play. Um, and Ashley, you know, we lived together for about a year and a half uh, in Grand Canary with the ACB club. And again, he, because we had Joel who just got drafted in the first round, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I think he was working in Sainsbury's or something two years before. Yeah. Yeah. It was like shit, you know. I've got five years before my my time or my 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 draft date. So he motivated me. I'm sure he did Ashley too. They, they were close, them two, because they were the same age. But I looked up to him so much, and I still respect him. And I see him at Surrey, and I think, you know, just how off to you for what you've done. Um, but th- when I practiced with those guys, and when Menelik came in, and um, the older guys, and I just, you know, competed with them, and and, you know, we'd win the one-on-one stuff. That's when I knew I had something. But when I started playing in the Hospitalet, the Nike International Tournaments, that's when I realised, OK, um, we had Nikola Miritic, Musli, Monte Yunez. And that when I started, you know, dogging those guys, I realised, oh, OK, yeah, you know, this is what it was. And then the AAU tournaments as well. When I went to America when I was young, uh, with John Lucas at Rice University, we had, there was you know, uh, 100 plus NBA players in and out the gym throughout the summer. So about 15, 16, that's when I realised like, well, you know, this could happen. I've really got a chance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, because it was a time, you know, it was Hoop Summit. I think I was 15, yeah. 16 and these guys were 18 and they were about to go get their millions. So I was like, shit, you know, I, 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 I'm there. You know, yeah. I just got to wait. You know, I felt I could go at 15, if I'm honest with you. I didn't think I needed any time. Um, because I developed young, but um, obviously I did, but I would have. But uh, yeah, no, I would say about 15, 16 is when I really realised, well, you know, this is the best and, 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 I'm, and I'm competing with them. You obviously represent the national team from a very young age. Um, England's sort of talent ID uh, at the time, there was the, the under 13 regional tournament in Lillishaw. Do you kind of remember playing in that and kind of uh, the reaction and how, how you did? Uh, I don't really remember, man. I remember Jesse, you know, me and Jesse would have these drives, you know, and he would always be hard on me and tough on me and, and you know, no one foot fadeaways and, you know, but, you know, he'd always get on to me, those things. Um, he did it, you know, he kept me grounded because I know he knows when I went to those camps, I did well and I performed and I, and, and he, and on the drive homes, he would ask me questions about the plays and the sets and who did I think was the best player at the camp and who, you know, and stuff like that. And, and he was hard on me and I needed it and it was good for me. Um, but um, I remember that we won, if I'm correct. I think we did. And um, I remember a lot of the players that were there. Uh, but I know that gave me the doors to go to Estonia with the England uh, under-16 team that was a couple of years older than me. And that was really, really special. Me and Cameron and Levi, if I'm correct. Levi Noel. Uh, we, Cameron who? Yeah. Cameron... Uh, Killer Cam, Killer Cam. Uh, oh, Cameron Katayan. Yeah, yeah. There you go. K- yeah, K-Man's yeah, little yeah, brother. Yeah. yeah, I remember yeah, Cameron. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah so we, we we got to go, and it was it was um, that was an eye opener. That was tough. That was tough. You know, the the cold, the snow. I think Matt Williams. Don't you remember him? Was uh, F- he was a killer. Oh, he was a killer. He was a bully. So it was good. It was good. It was good for me. Yeah, it toughened me up, and oh, because they were eighty nines, so they were quite a bit older than me so, at the time. Uh, at what point did uh, the sort of European clubs come knocking to try and recruit you and, and get you out of the country? Because um, this is where I struggle. Because for me, I, no, I went to the European Championships with the 90s, so I would have been 15. Mm-hmm. And 
I think. I did well. I didn't do great. I had some big games. Uh, I had some really big preseason games. But, you know, Euro hoops, Euro hopes. Euro hopes, Euro hopes. Things yeah, yeah. like that. There was no social media. There was nothing out there. I think it was all word of mouth back then at that, that time. And I think people obviously heard about a seven-foot kid or probably maybe six, nine at those times. But I didn't do great at the European Championships. I was just big. Um, and I had a good game against Bosnia. And then I think Estudiantes came because of Dan Clark. Uh, my mum, Mark Clark, was huge. He helped my mum a lot understand it. And they flew us into Madrid and put us up. And Will McDonald, who is, uh, has the highest efficiency in the ACB, uh, was there at the time. Played for Taos and Amica. He was there. And we ended up being teammates later. Uh, in Grand Canaria, and I can't remember who else was there, but we went to Sudanese for the for the three days, and they put us up, and we had room service, and and we never experienced anything. We flew in, and we got to see all of Madrid, and we went to David Beckham's kids' school, uh, met Dan, and it was amazing. And then Grand Canaria got wind, and then they did the exact same thing, but they flew me and all my sisters down to Tenerife and put us in a five star hotel, and yeah, it was good. You know, they they. You know, they see a single mother and they knew what they were doing and they, you know, knew how to try to, you know, recruit a kid. And, and I ended up going to Grand Canaria. I think because of Joel, that was pretty big. Joel's dad and his mum also helped my mum and gave him advice. But I think because Joel done it, you know, he got drafted and that's nothing against Dan. But I think that was the whole selling point. You know, it, it, it was... And Grand Canaria was a little bit nicer as well, I think. It was a bit more sunnier, so... So, that, so you, you went... Did you leave in 2006? It was the same year that Joel got drafted? Was that the same? Was it the same year? Uh, yeah, 2006 is when I left. 2006, 2007 season. That was my first season there. So you would have been 15, 16 years old? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. How, how was the, um, the contract approached in terms of like, what, was, what were the terms of your contract? How, how was it worked out? Obviously, you know, you're going in, like you said, you kind of yeah. had to get advice from various people, speak to different people. Uh, you haven't done this before, like kind of what was the actual process of, you know, getting you to, to, well, just to, to sign with, with, with Grand Canaria? Well, it was one of those ones where, you know, um, all of the coaches in England and all of the, you know, the people that are supposed to, you go to for advice. It was only, it was only, uh, Dan's parents or Joel's parents. No one in England had had a kid like me before and didn't know what to do. So as much as I loved Jesse and loved um, Simon Fisher and those guys that I had, how do you go to them and say, what do we do? You know, because we didn't. So we kind of just, we just went with our, you know, our gut feeling. Um, you know, obviously, you know, my mum was taken care of and, and, and we had some money coming in. So we didn't have to stress and worry. But there wasn't anyone to ask, you know, it was like, who, you know, there's kids now all the time. They ask me, they say, Oh, wh wh what do I do? Where do I go? Blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, if you got it, you got it. And if the people around you in today, you know, with social media and stuff, they'll find you. It's harder to trust, you know? And I think maybe having too many options is just as bad as having no options or, you know, um, and it was, it was, it. it was kind of, we went with who we felt more, um, at home with Joel was a huge factor because he just got drafted um, and that was it and the whole negotiation was kind of was us it was us it was us and we had some advice from certain people but nobody really knew you know what they were doing at the time did you, you, know, did you have any type of, leap. did you have an agent or any type of representation no 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 I met a guy um, Rob Rob who kind of you know, he was a master of what he does. You know, he was very smart. You know, he knew he, he'd done it before. You know, he did it for Joel and he you know, found players. And, and all credit to him, you know, he's given some guys that are, let's say, C-plus players and they've had B-plus careers. He's, he's, he's made guys money and he's helped guys. And they've, you know, this is, people this say... This is Rob Oriana. Rob Oriana. People say what they say about him. Um, you know, I had a good relationship with him. Uh, I remember we went to the Nike Hoop Summit um, and we got there and they gave four suitcases of gear to every uh, player. And I was there as just to, I was there just to see if he has it. They wanted to see if this kid is really what Robbie is saying. Rob was like, oh, this kid, he's better than um, a jinker. 
Solomon Alabami, uh, Batum, he's better than all of them. You know, he was that's how he was selling me, and they were like, yeah, yeah, okay, let's see. Because you have got to remember now, there's, there's not no social media days where this is, you know. And we went there, and they didn't give me anything. They didn't give me any no no clothes, no gear. And he went in the room. He goes, when you go in that practice, you fucking kill every one of them. Okay, you make them sign you to a contract before we leave here. And it was motivation, you know, because he always knew how to get them to fire me. You know, he talked about how my dad wasn't in my life. He talked about where I was from and how no one respected anybody from Kent and what's Kent, it's a farm. And he put it in me and, and we went to practice and I, I hold my own and I dominated some of the practices and opened everybody's eyes. And I think I went back to maybe six bags of, of Nike gear. Uh, and, you know, he just knew, he knew me, he knew what, how to, you know, how to, to, to motivate me, how to push me. And I put a lot of trust and a lot of faith in him. And after that, I remember, um, you're going to have to help me here, Sam. The coach from Duke, Coach McKesky, uh, came and sat at a table with me after coach the K. Hoop Summit. Coach K. Um, coach, uh, Kyle, is it Kyle Perry? Kyle Perry, really yeah. Bad here. yeah. Came and sat with me and he didn't like it. He didn't like that those guys because, you know, they were like, oh, you know, people's mouth started watering over this 15-year-old kid that hasn't committed. Anywhere. And that's when I went back to Grand Canary and got hidden. I kind of got hidden and I didn't go to any events. I didn't go to any tournaments. I didn't go to any exposure things. Because, you know, I would have been poached. Players get poached, and that is what happened. Um, and that kind of ruined our relationship because people on the outside were now messaging me on MSN, talking to me on Bebo, on uh, Facebook, on these things. And they were saying, you should be here, you should be here. And then, you know, I'm seeing guys, Miritich, uh, Musli, those guys getting the exposure. And, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. He, he wanted to hide me for a couple of years and just, you know, calm it down until I was draft eligible. And people got involved and they got in my ear, my mother's ear, and they took advantage and they, they drifted us away, you know, um, from Rob. I think it was, it was good with what he was doing because it wasn't right what he was doing. But, you know, people weren't looking out for Ryan. They weren't saying, let's help Ryan. Let's, let's, let's. Ryan deserves to you know, had this or had that. And people took advantage of me. A lot of people did, you know, British people within the British system, people within, um, you know, within Spain. Uh, a lot of people did. A lot. Daryl Reshaw. I don't even remember who Daryl Reshaw yeah, yeah. was. Yeah. Big, he helped me a lot. He helped me a lot. He, he, he showed me what people were doing. He showed me what these clubs are doing. He showed me that these buyouts were unfair with what you're making. He clued me up. He taught me everything. And from then, you know, I put it on myself to never really... Uh, let anyone take advantage or fool me again. And I, you know, I took it a bit too extreme, you know, where I struggled to trust people um, because Rob was like a father, you know, he, he, he knew what he was doing. He, he really got close to me and, you know, we had some real close moments and we, you know, we had laughs and tears and stuff. And, you know, if he would have been honest with me and said, look, I need some sort of agreement. Between, you know, if he would have been real with me, then maybe then okay. But yeah, it was, it, it was, it was a lot of mess. You know, I had no system team strategy around me. And that's what I really preach to these players now. Get a team around you that is going to help you and, and guide you in the right way. What's your relationship like with Rob now? We don't talk. We haven't spoke. I think there was a um, Harrison Memorial Tournament. Harrison Royal, I yeah. Think, yeah, I think I gave his team 40 and dumped on all these big men and went to shake his hand after the game and he just looked to me like, nah. You know, and he, he did a lot for me. You know, he did he did do a lot for me. He, he put me in them situations. Yeah. But, you know, if there's a kid sitting there with, you know, you know, Coach K, you know, you've got to let him go. You know, you can't hold that back. You know, that's, that's you know, because of your pocket and that's, you know, and I started to see those things. Now I look, I'm older, I see those things. But when you're younger, you don't, you know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're naive. Do you um, just to give kind of context on on the situation? So he he, he originally because he was originally obviously worked with Joel as well. He was an assistant. Was he an assistant or he was some type of staff member at actual the the Grand Canary ACB club? And then he ended up breaking away to set up Grand Canary uh, Canarias Basketball Academy. Is, is that correct? And then so with your yeah. involvement, you ended up going to the academy with him when he first set, set it up. I went there for like two three months. Uh, and it was just, it was atrocious. It was terrible. It was just flooded with British kids. I felt I could have been back home playing, you know, it was, uh, it was the kids that, you know, he was like, he would, you know, he'd always say, these guys are here to pay for you guys, but we wasn't getting any money. So what, <laughs> what, what was we, what was he yeah. paying for? 
They were taking advantage of a lot of kids, I think. But again, you can say that, but they were getting basketball two, three times a day. They were being fed, they were being housed, they were being exposed to things they wasn't in England. So can you put a price on that? I don't know. If you had it and you was that talented, you know, he can, you know, anyone can come to you, Sam, and say, I can give you this and this and this and this because they want you to give them money, right? But if you are that good, if you have it, you've got to think he's a businessman. You know, it's, it's, it's a business. They're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get what you want. All kids want to go to D1, right? That's what most British kids want to do. They can get you there, but it's if you have what it takes in a sense, you know? And I think there's a lot of things I don't understand about it. And there's a lot of things like undercover and there's a lot of like money deals and things that I hear about. I know nothing about it, but when I'm only from my experience when I was there, it was just full of British kids that weren't, really that good you know some of them you could just tell like you've paid this much money to come here for a year and you're promised to go d1 but, you know and some kids were really really good and, and and i think they paid less but i don't know too much about it if i'm honest with you but it wasn't for me and i left after three months yeah like i sent you there was a sports illustrated expose that was done a few years ago linking linking uh canaris basketball academy to kind of uh, payments linking to tours and stuff like that. I don't. I don't fully know know the ins and outs of it either. Obviously, not a lot, lot of people do, but um, clearly, yeah. it wasn't all above board. Uh, so, yeah. so w- when you look back now, obviously, you know, speaking to Coach K Calipari, um, do you think that if there wasn't that, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, sort of interference, you would have ended up? going the US college route is that would that have been your preferred option or do you think that actually maybe even if you were allowed to go you would have probably stayed in Europe oh no see Rob told me you know if you go to college you're not getting paid they can't pay you a penny which is a lie as we know I would have went <laughs> to college I wouldn't have went to college like that and I honestly believe I mean I see you know people say oh what happened what happened what happened with this person? I was injured I was drafted I needed double shoulder surgery you know it's it, it, there wasn't any way around it I got phone calls in the first round like if we pick you will you go back overseas and I said no you know I I, I wasn't a um, so you know if if I would have went to college who knows I could have tore me ACL or you know my Achilles you don't know what could happen right yeah so it worked out well I got where I wanted to get I wanted to be drafted that was my goal I got drafted by an amazing organization and and you know injuries got me and the lockout and timing and opportunity but yeah, I, I would have definitely bought my mum a house from probably the payroll of Duke or from a booster. And yeah, I would, I, you've got to go. But I didn't know that. You know, my my the person I trusted was Rob. So I didn't think I could get any money. I thought, oh, no, I need this little bit of money I'm making to, yeah. you know, to survive. You know, if I go to college, I've got to study. I thought I had to study 10 hours a day. Yeah. I didn't know people could do my exams for me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that. So... Do you know what, when, yeah. I've, when I've been to the states and visited some US colleges and uh, kind of the 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 study centers and stuff, and then they you know they give you the tour and they kind of give you the spiel about all, uh, kind of what athletes get, and you're like, mm. what they get private tutoring for anything they want, essentially help on anything they want. It almost gets to the point, and I, I do believe that the American education system is probably easier in many cases, unless you're going to, yeah. you know, one of the one of the, the finer educational institutions. But, but I do think the yeah. uh, yeah, the the general st- sort of level of academia, especially when I speak to English kids that go to the states, they just say, you know, the stuff we're learning is very basic compared to what I'm used to in England. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, when you hear of like college athletes failing, you're like, I don't understand how you can possibly fail, you know, with all the help yeah. and support you're given. Um, it's absolutely mad. Hundred uh, percent. But yeah, so I mean, yeah, it would have been crazy. Did you, did you, like, because that's the other thing, right? Is that Europe is a bit of a it can be a bit of a wild west, you know, uh, you know, being a young player. It, this... it, Go on. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, it can, but I always say like, how many players have gone to college from England and made it? How many, you know more than me, how many kids from England have gone to like um, a top 20 D1 school? And had a good career or yeah, what gone is? to the NBA yeah. or had a, 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 a you know, I don't, so when kids are, I just want to go to America. They just say, I'm going to get there. I'm going to go to any school. And I, and I love it. I love that belief. And I'm going to make my way. I'm going to make it. I think it's great if you go and you, you get your degree and you, you network and you find a community in our home. But I think it's got to be the right situation. I think there's a lot of talent. Like, you know, my nephew, 
this, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Sam, he's going number one, 2033. Um, he, 2033, if he, how old is he? If he, he's five. If he's got it, if he, <laughs> if he's got it, then I'll say, okay, we need, you know, we're going to go to a, a top school with a top coach and you're going to go there and just, you know, do the right thing and you're going to get drafted. You, you know, you're going to have a chance to make your money in the NBA. But if you're just a guy that's like, yeah, I think it's, you've got to choose. Is it academics? But a lot of kids, like you said, they go there, they're not there to study. They're not there to focus on getting a degree. They're there to go there and prove everybody wrong and that they should be in the NBA. And I think, you know, mentally you've got to say, you've got to look at the statistics. I mean, everyone's different, but I see a lot of guys who just want to go to America because their aim is to be a pro. And I think you can go to certain clubs, um, at a young age and work your way up and make a little bit of money and, and, and become a legitimate pro and have a good career in Europe. So I think it is fine the right situation. Um, but I think mentally, if you're going to college, you need to go there with the right mindset of I'm going there to get my degree, Yeah. you know, not to transfer or to this or to that. And, but that's, 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 I, I haven't experienced any of that. So it's hard to speak on, but I do see a lot of guys going there and, you know, I don't see them, I know they're good. I know that I know they're really good, and I know they could have a great career in Europe. Yeah. Um, but with the market in with the market today, I would go to college. That's the advice I would give. As a um, as a junior player, just I, I think it would be interesting for people if you if you're willing to share. But as a you know 16, 17 year old in in Europe, what kind of money were you able to earn uh, at that sort of age as a basketball player? Was it much more about your, the accommodation, the education they're giving you, and then a little bit of top up? Or were you actually able to earn sort of real career professional level money? Back back then, like so, you're talking two thousand and seven, eight, nine. I mean, Ricky Rubio was playing for Juventus and he was making sixty. And I think when he got drafted, uh, he was on, I think, eighty thousand. So it was anywhere between fifty and a hundred. Some guys were making twenty, but you could make, let's say, between twenty and a and a, at 15, I would say maybe 20 to 60 is what you could make. Um, now, they'll assign you for three, four years, and it will go up a lot. But it all depends. Are you on the ACB team? Are you on the men's team? Um, there will be bonuses and things in there. But a lot of the time, would I would you know would I say some like in today's market I couldn't tell you but I know it's not it's not in the 30s I'm pretty sure like it, you, there's kids that are making maybe 20 to 30 thousand a year maybe 15 but back then you could get a good contract you could get a contract for like three years 90 80 to 90 thousand a year um, and it could spike if you get onto the first team but the the buyout will spike so you know if you are killing and you play on the first team um, and then the A team start come they you know they they come sniffing and stuff yeah they, your buyout's going to be maybe a million and the NBA can only put up half a million so where's that other half a million coming from and then then what happens is is the team will draft you then they want to stash you and they'll say well you've got to pay half a million you're only going to make half a million how about you stay there for two more years then they give you another contract for probably two hundred two fifty you're happy but then the buyout goes to two million. And then it keeps, you know, it's, it's the, the the draft and stash system is smart. It's very clever. Yeah. Um, but back in those days, I would say, yeah, if you're 15, 16, and you was making more than 60, I'd be that'd be pretty impressive. So after, well, in fact, actually, that initial contract that you signed with with, with uh, Gran Canaria, like, was how many yeah. years was that for? It was three years. So it's three years because Rob knew three years we don't want to buy out we want to go so he was clever so, so then in that sense he looked after me in those ways you know he took care of me yeah you know he he didn't but when i got to grand care and they saw me after you know a month six weeks then they started wanting to do a five six year deal more money bring my mum in take they wanted to offer a lot more because they knew well shit you know we uh you and, know and we, you didn't you didn't want to go for it yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to jump on it because I was, you know, we were just money, money, money. That's all we wanted. You know, we wanted to come from nothing, and we thought, whoa. But Rob was like, no, 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 no. But then when he took me to events and took me to things, that's when he was like, look, we got to get an agreement or something between us because, you know. And then I saw other guys at the time 
Um, there was Miritich, there was a lot of, uh, there was Musli, there was Miritich, there was those guys. They were making a lot of money, but you've got to remember, they wasn't trying to go to the NBA at 19. They were happy to go at, in, at 22, 23. So they were signing six-year contracts with the, the, the bonus of, oh, okay, if you play this many games, with the, you know, so, but for me, my goal was the NBA, 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 because of Joel and because of, that was my dream. That was my dream. That's all I wanted. I didn't have any interest in playing, you know, I, it, it didn't, I didn't, um, not in a rude way, but I didn't look at the EuroLeague and think, oh, wow. You know, I just thought you're rejects of the NBA. That's generally what I thought as a kid. And I just thought I'm better than that. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not going to be playing it. And I took that with me into practice and the older guys saw that and some of them liked it and some of them didn't like it. And, you know, I, I always had something to prove. And they took me under their wing and, and Will McDonald was huge. James Augustine, Daniel Kicker, Melvin Saunders, all those guys were huge for me when I was younger and they helped me, you know. I was going to say one of the one of the things I was doing is the the research was watching all your NBA draft workout videos and some of the interviews and stuff that that you were doing yeah, when you yeah, were kind yeah. of in the run up to it, and one of them someone was saying, you know, like you seem to be very averse to to going back to Europe and, you know, why are you so intent on on being here and you're literally just like, you know, I've been in Europe since I was. 14, 15 years old. The NBA is where I want to be, and yeah. even if the G League is well, at the time, it was the D League. The D League is, you know, a lower le- lower level. Um, that's that's going to be help me be closer to reaching reaching the league, and that's why I kind of yeah, I'm very American focused. Like that's kind of maintained through for well for your entire yeah, time. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Because you you got to look at it. Big Baby just won a championship when I got drafted, and I was with Big Baby all summer. Um, Michael Beasley was making he got his 20 million contract from Minnesota so all these guys that I was with the Hoop Summit are now making silly silly money and I was with you guys three years ago so to me I'm like well I've done Europe I've played against my age groups I've done the AAU I've done everything now so you know for them it's like well you haven't played you know I was like well look at the highlights I look at the film the film's there I've I've done it like I've shown I can do it look look at people like Giannis like Giannis Antetokounmpo so, you know, you can tell a kid, ah, uh, he's not tested. But I played Europeans. I played GB national team. I've played in Switzerland, which isn't a great league, but it was a, you know, it was a mid-European league. Uh, I've played with all the NBA guys. I've played with all the guys that are getting their next contracts now. So it's my time. You know, don't try to tell me about ACB and all the, because, you know, I don't, I felt I was better than it. You know, I felt that I was better than it. I felt that I was, I, I, even though I didn't do it, it was hard because I got, I got passed around so much and pissed about so much. But when I practiced with those ACB guys every single day in practice, they all told me, go to the NBA, go get 50 million, go to the NBA. You're, you, you're just get there, stay there, focus. You don't need to be here. Because you deal with coaches, you deal with people with attitudes, you deal with people who are trying to discipline you. They see a 19-year-old kid and they're forgetting that he's just done five years around pros you see a 22 year old kid out of college he's a 22 year old kid out of college you know people don't think that they think oh he's young but it's just because somebody's young it depends you know what they've been through mm. you know so yeah. yeah the uh i remember actually you know talking about the draft process there was it was the pre-draft camp i feel that really kind of started putting you on the map and started getting you buzz mm. uh which i think was in was in chicago um yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And I've got, I've actually on a hard drive somewhere, which I'll try and dig up at some point. I've actually got the ESPN airing talking about You've got this. It. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've been looking for that man. Yeah, yeah, Talk, yeah. Talking about this kid from England that is, uh, that's creating a buzz because of his performance at the camp and stuff like that. And he's got some a few little clips and that. Kind of what, what are your memories uh, of, of of that camp and kind of what what happened as a result of it? So I, um, I was in Switzerland and I was playing Call of Duty every day. <laughs> Uh, and I had, I had um, dislocated my shoulder in Switzerland, so I didn't play for six weeks. But uh, um, BC Monte, absolutely top club, uh, true professionals and lovely people, let me stay there and I rehabbed with a guy and I just was... And the agent was like, oh, do you want to come and do some workouts in the States? Just workouts, not the drafting, just like, do you want to come work out? And I said, okay, cool. So they bring me in the gym and Herb Rudoy who was Ku Coach's, uh, and Lucky Capioni, who was Ku Coach's agent, um, Sabonis, all the top Europeans, they brought me in the gym with some other guys, and they said, this is the most talented player we've ever seen. And after that, Herb said, right, 
let me do some phone calls. So he told Monte Yunis to go back to Europe for another year to push me and then for me to take his combine spot. When I went there, I saw John Lucas. I saw all the people that I've seen over five, six years, coaches from all over, and I felt at home. And when I tell you these guys' shoes weren't tied up, I remember Cousins, Gordon Hayward, no, Cousins, Craig Brackens, Hassan Whiteside, Daniel Walton were all standing on the baseline, just shoes untied, jerseys untucked. You know, I've got my jersey tucked in, like, real tight. You know, I've got my shoulders up. And, and, and I was running like a deer and dunking everything as hard as I could. And I, 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 this was my chance. And these guys were coming out there just because they knew they were going to be a top pick. They didn't want to get injured. A lot of people don't, you know, um, participate in the combine. And after that, you know, people really were like, whoa, you know, who, like, who is this kid? But then you get the people that when you don't know and you're supposed to know, you have to act like you know. And then people started having, it, oh, he's this and this. But nobody knew me because I just was hidden for three, four years, right? So you can't say, who are you? We don't know you, but then you've got an opinion about me. So um, it was amazing. I just remember I was in the hotel sitting there. I was eating uh, chicken fingers and milk. And on the TV came on, it was like Ryan Richards. And I was like, and I was like, I had a little, I can't remember what phone I had. I was trying to record the screen and call my mom. And I was like, I'm on, I'm on the TV, like, what the fuck? And it was amazing. It was uh, that, that was, you know, as I tell about kids needing something, like a little, because sometimes you don't know how good you are. You don't know how well you've done unless somebody tells you, you know, and no one tells you at the combine you've done well because we're all there competing, right? And we're all there and they're, and scouts are quiet and they're, they're in, but when I saw that on ESPN, man, I, 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 it motivated me. And we had some really good battles in the workouts. I think I had maybe 18 workouts, a couple of double workouts. Um, a lot of Larry Sanders was very, he was real competitive. He went hard every single drill, you know, but there was some guy like Hassan Whiteside, man, this guy. I mean, you thought he was going, he, he, he just strolling up the court. Like a lot, because a lot of guys know they're going to get drafted, you know, and, 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 and they don't take it as serious. But this was like my chance to find stability as we go back to. I wanted some stability and, and uh, it was amazing. It was truly amazing and, and I'll never forget it. And um, I still see guys to this day in the summer because it was in Chicago and I stay in Chicago most summers. And we still talk about it to this day, you know, and it's unfortunate with the injuries and things that have happened, but... You know, you, at the time, uh, I remember you saying kind of you felt uh, New York, Memphis and San Antonio were the three kind of fits that you felt you were sort of the yeah, best opportunity Atlanta, for you. Yeah, Atlanta. Oh, the best opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of what, where you were hoping yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm also right. I'm thinking that San Antonio had potentially spoken about picking you 20th uh, in the first round. Mm-hmm. Uh and yeah, it was yeah. essentially it was the injuries that ended up making you slide. Like kind of go, I guess going into draft night, how confident were you you were going to get drafted or was it like you know I guess by that point because you were the last what was it 49th pick right so at that point you're kind of like I guess hope is start, sort of fading you're like oh maybe this isn't going to happen yeah, um, yeah kind yeah, of definitely. what was the expectation going into it and how it played out I mean it was one of those ones where the combine happened the whole world knew uh, the hype was there um, out of 18 workouts I would say I had 16 great workouts one, Memphis, I shot the ball really bad. You know, I think they was excited from my... I had a private workout with Eric Botang, which is another good story, where I ended up, he ended up clotheslining me because it, uh, it was getting a little bit... Scores a bit uneven. And we still joke about that in Chicago now. Uh, and they came on that to like, like, don't let these guys play one-on-one. Like, you know, let's just do some skill stuff. And uh, I haven't spoken to Eric about that, actually. So when he watches this, if he does, he, um, I owe him a clothesline for that. Um, but Memphis, I was really excited about Memphis because, you know, um, I played there for the Hoop Summit. So I knew the courts, I knew the rims. You know, I'd been there. I felt at home. The, the, the scouts really liked me. And they, they came to, they actually came to other workouts when I did in Atlanta. And they were there and stuff and in the gym and in... New York. And they brought me in with Grievous Vasquez, the guard. Do you remember him from yeah. uh, Venezuela? We were actually roommates during the combine. And they actually took him 28. And uh, I was sure. I was like, and I went in there, man, and I shot really bad. Really, really, really bad. I, I didn't shoot the ball very well. Um, and that's big. And those workouts is big. You know, they, they, 
you can work out in your gym, you can work out at the combine, you come, but when you come to their place and the, all the eyes are there, there was a lot of people. And it was annoying. It was sad because I thought, well, this is it, isn't it? This is where I started. First time I ever went to America was Memphis, and now I'm back here. But I didn't shoot the ball very well. I didn't have the best workout. Um, Luke Harron Godi, they took in the second round. Um, actually, he was in my workout. So, you know, I knew how well I did. I thought, well, someone's going to pick me. I didn't know, you know, well, you didn't go to college or you have serious shoulder problems. I didn't think I was anything because I was still playing and I was still doing well. I didn't understand how serious anything was. And I didn't know how big of a deal it was to get drafted. I just thought, well, you get drafted and you go and you sign your contract and then, you know, you, you go win a championship like Big Baby or... I just thought this is how my mom was thinking. I wasn't thinking these were big steps. And then when it got to the Spurs calling my agent, who was Ginobili's agent, and said, we're taking him at 20 right now if he goes back overseas. And I said, no, I'm not going. I said, no, I'm not going. And then after that, the lines got cold from there to 49. So the rumour, people say, oh, the results were leaked of your shoulders or something, but because my agent was the only one that had them, you know, obviously. But who knows? I don't, you know, you don't know. But I was starting to uh, to shit myself a little bit. And then my mum called me and she went, you did it, you did it, you did it. And she goes, why don't they, they, why don't they take you earlier? And I said, yeah, well, we got we got picked, mum. So we're, we're, <laughs> we'll take that. Yeah. And that was it. But it was amazing. Absolutely amazing experience. We, um, we were drinking in a bar uh, in Chicago and we were doing shots. I think after the, the lottery went, because they told me you probably won't go lottery. You know, and I said, okay. We started doing a shot every pick, so we started struggling. Me, Miles she must have Davis, been plastered by the time. <laughs> <laughs> me and Miles Davis, uh, Jeffrey Durkin, who played in the yeah. BBL, yeah, quite a top guy, man. And then we were there, and uh, Basil, uh, my agent at the time, and we were all there at the bar. And then after, like, I think Atlanta had forty-seven or something. No, Milwaukee had forty-seven, and they took Tiny Gun, and I thought oh, they liked me when I was there. So I went to the toilet and then when I went to the toilet, I was just, you know, pissing and I heard, wow, the whole bar went crazy. And my name, I didn't even, I think my name come across the bottom. So we started drinking, we're like, oh, can we get some more drinks? And the bartender was like, you guys have got to get the fuck out. We were like, what? He was like, you're 19, mate. It says it there, you're 19 on the screen. We were like, oh, because we obviously, we, it's 40, they thought we were older. And uh, that was amazing, absolutely amazing, man. Like I wouldn't change a thing. Me, Miles and uh, Jeff, we went to a club afterwards and, yeah, man, we, we partied like rock stars and we had a good time. But great memories. And then Popovich called me straight away, actually. He called me straight away and was like, I'm excited to get you down here, get to work. He watched, I had two workouts at San Antonio. He came to both. Um, great chats with him, man. Just truly one of the best people I've met, you know. Uh, and I was around him for a whole year. Um, and it was great. It was, it was great. You know, the injuries, the injuries, you know, you're not going to sign a guy with double shoulder surgery, are you? It's just life. And then after that, you know, I had some bad decisions as far as chasing the money, you know, rather than... Because uh, I got there. You know, I got there. I was on the door. I got my jersey ready. My press conference was ready. They just wanted to do the MRI. They did the MRIs on the shoulders, and they were like, this guy can't play. Like, you know, it, 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 maybe with his left shoulder, but the right one. So then I just... I remember I just cried, man. I cried. Um, just cried for hours, man. Because it was like, I just got there. You know, I moved on my things from Chicago to San Antonio. My agent flew in town. It was his first... It was his first player that he had drafted. Ronald Shade. He's Luol Deng's, like, good friend. But he wasn't um, Deng's actual agent. He was just a close friend. So I was kind of his first player. And, yeah, we were upset, man. It was, it was tough. It was tough. And then uh, I went to eat with Del Demps. He took me to eat afterwards because he was the assistant GM at the time. He was like, keep your head up. I'm going to get you healthy. And then, you know, see what happens with the lockout and stuff. But I was just done mentally, you know. I worked in all them years to get there. And I worked my I worked my ass off. I worked so hard to get in the best shape of my life after that. And I came to GB and stuff. And, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. But amazing, amazing memories, amazing experiences. Met great people along the way. And then I can never change that. 
Yeah, like well, yeah. I remember on draft night, I stayed up for it. I was, I, I don't know, I found some type of illegal stream somewhere, and uh, cause I, I was, I was doing the the the. You remember the Ryan Richards pre-draft timeline of tracking every single workout, every single yeah, tweet yeah, that was yeah. done about you or whatever. And then I, so I was just waiting just to get the screenshot of when. And again, it was yeah, the name, the name on the screen. I'm sure that I probably got that picture still somewhere. Uh, mm. But it was big. It was obviously big news, and it's it's one of them things where the, the NBA has such a. The NBA is just so different in its ability to be able to cut into the mainstream here where all of a sudden it was like the next day you actually did get the mainstream press coverage because it was like you know english english kid you know selected in by the nba like p- picked into the nba or whatever so it kind of did make a a little bit of uh a little bit of noise over yeah, here yeah 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 and that, that because first... that's the thing with the british culture man if it, if, if it didn't get drafted it wouldn't have been anything yeah and that's the thing you know when i talk to players about it you know and they're like oh but you didn't play in the nba Playing, I didn't play in the NBA, but you know, it, 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 why didn't I play in the NBA? You know, you don't know why I didn't play in the NBA. You think it's because oh, he wasn't good enough, or because of Tim Duncan, or because of, no, it's, it, there's many reasons why players don't make it or they don't get there. Yeah. And I think you know, you should still be proud of your accomplishments. And if you've done something that no one else has done, you know, it doesn't give you bragging rights. It just make you humble. It should make you work harder, which it did. Yeah. But you know, GB was just a killer for me. You know, that Olympic build-up was just. <laughs> Once that went wrong, man, I just thought, you know what? Like, you know, I've given my all here for yeah. like two years, come off double shoulder surgery, and then, you know, not making it. It was tough, and that really kind of put me in a, in a, you know, like fuck everyone, you know, like because I never had anyone helping me or really truly looking out for my best interests. And then, I don't think the Spurs understood that. I don't think they knew my story, you know. They do their background check and they check if, you know, there's pictures of you online and videos and they ask other players, you know, does he drink, does he smoke, does he part? But they don't really, you know, they don't come to sit in Bourne, Kent. They don't see where you're from. They don't see the stuff. Because, they sh- and why should they? They shouldn't have to, you know. This is a job. You're at the highest level. You know, you've got an opportunity to be here. And I came in and I worked every day and I worked hard and I got praise from R.C. Buford and my teammates and everyone every day. But... I just needed someone to just hold me, man, and like grab me and say, look, we're going to get you there. And, you know, this is your family. This is your team. And I never read that. Yeah. And then when I never got that through GB either, I just thought, you know, fuck this, man. Like, and I just said, let me get my money. Let me go get my money. Let me go set myself up where I haven't got to depend on anyone to make me happy, depend on anyone to put money in my pocket. And then I went to Asia and I met some of my best friends today and have managed to, you know, um, own a home and manage to do things that, you know, a lot of players say they, they can't say they've done. Yeah. And that was all due to just, yeah, kind of doing my own thing a little bit. But, uh, yeah. For sure. I mean, I was actually, yeah, I mean, there's only, well, first of all, you're the only British developed player to have been drafted in the last decade, uh, first of all. So that's obviously an accomplishment in itself. From Kent, I, from Kent, mate. And, and the only player ever to get drafted from Kent. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then also, I think there's only, there's only, 12 players that have come through the UK system that have ever been drafted. Um, you know, when you're not counting guys that have got passports or whatever that left here when they were one years old and, and stuff like that. But when you actually talk about yeah, yeah, guys yeah. that have sort of been products of the UK system. So you are in a, in a in elite company. But it's interesting you kind of say all, all that contextual stuff that the Spurs were missing because I, I remember, um, so that obviously you got drafted and then that first year you were basically, you had your surgery and you were rehabbing in San Antonio, right? And then this, yep. the season after you went to Switzerland again, Right. Yeah. 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 Because I remember speaking on the phone with you when you just when you were in Switzerland, um, and basically you were saying that the Spurs wanted to see that you could that 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 you could stay at a team for a full season because you've been a bit of a journeyman uh, up until that point and kind of I don't know I don't know what they were wondering but they wanted to see and they kind of said that to you and then it got to Christmas yeah. they got to Christmas and you left the club that you're with and went somewhere else yeah. and I was just like I can't believe that. You know, you're in a situation where the Spurs are here, ready to select you, well, ready to bring you in, but they just want to see you. Need just need to stay in one place for the whole season, and you weren't yeah. able to do it. But I guess that comes back down to all of this stuff that's going on around it, where you're just like, yeah. you know what? Everyone's shafting me. Everyone's everyone's looking out exactly. for themselves what they can get from Ryan, and I'm gonna do what I'm what's best for me. I'm gonna do what's best for Ryan. Kind of, do you, do yeah. you remember kind of how you're approaching it? Well, I remember I went into Switzerland and I had Mo Abukar. He's one of the smoothest post-up players I've seen. You know, he went to San Diego State. Um, I actually learned a lot from him. Mike Afebra, called him Money Mike, who uh, was making, I think, a couple of thousand dollars in Switzerland. And then he ended up going 
I think he gave Kobe 30 at Drew League, and then he went and got a million in China. So he's had a great story. That's a good read, if, you know, Mike Athebra. And these guys were 28, 29, you know, and it was their time. They wasn't going to let no kid come in and just run the show. So when I was with them, it was literally just run, rebound, support these guys, terrible shot selections, and just, and that was it. And I'll, and then, you know, I had a guy come in from the Spurs. I forgot his name. And he came in. He was in um, Partizan looking at Bertans. And then he came to see me. And he just was talking to me like, just somewhere where I couldn't, you know, just talking to me like pure disrespect. Like coming at me like trying to be like tough love. And I, at the time, I just was like, you know, like, fuck no. Like I can't do it. With everything I'm going through right now, with all the shaft and of all I've been through, you think I have to, mentally I'm strong enough to let two guys control my career, you know. Uh, I think one of the players was sleeping with the coach's wife. Uh, I think it was just a mess. And they're like, Bertans is making this much. I was like, yeah, and I'm fucking... I, I was making 5,000 Swiss, Swiss, uh, Swiss, Swiss francs there after being drafted. I had made more than that before I got drafted. So I didn't play for a year and a half, and then I'd go and make less money. And after that talk with him and how he thought who I was and how he came at me, I just thought, you know what? Like, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm getting offers for 30, 40, 50,000 a month. And I'm sitting here playing behind these guys. Like, you know, there wasn't... I, I just couldn't do it. Mentally, I thought, you know what? No. And I went to... Uh, I left. Left with nothing. I had no job. I had offers. They left. I just left. I got out of there. Um, I couldn't do it. You know, I felt like I was abandoned. I felt like I was left. I felt like I wasn't playing well. Or, you know, again, I didn't have... At 15, 16, I had some real role models around me. Real pros. And then I go to playing with guys that are there to... Um, to eat, you know, we're all there to eat. We're in a low level in Europe. We're not here to be friends and be buddies and help you be successful, right? I need to provide for my family and we'll more respect to that. So I left. I left. I went to um, Georgia. Um, I think maybe it was 25,000 for, I think, five weeks. So five weeks ago, I went there, yeah. And I was making 5,000 Swiss francs. So it was, to me, it was like, well... You know, and then I got I got the taste. You know, I got the taste, Sam. I thought, you know, I thought, hey, well, if this is what it is. And then I went to Dubai, which was ridiculous money. Like, I, and I just, I, I, I went after the money. It gave me stability. It gave me a home. It gave me, you know, comfortability. And it made me do what I want to do. You know, it wasn't a... Do you, do, and, you, and, do you think because you were chasing the money... And obviously you were playing I wasn't in... chasing the money. I was never chasing the money. I was chasing the stability and the acceptance of being embraced by a country, you know, or by a team or by a club or by a coach. You know, as a British player, you go to Italy, Spain, you're not American and you're not Spanish or British. I was never chasing money. People say, oh, you went and got the bag. Yeah, I did get the bag because of my talent. But I just wanted to find a team. I would love to stay someone for seven, eight, ten years. Like, I'm around the Scorchers any time I can get because I love them boys. I just love being around them. Um... We need to find a sponsor, Korean. We need to we need to find one. But um, but no. I, I, so people say, oh, he's chasing the money. I was never chasing the money. I just was chasing like a home, like a a group a group what were like you know we accept you for you and you know we want to build something together. And um, and yeah, man, yeah. The, yeah, I was gonna uh, kind of on on that note. I guess the irony of it in in many ways is that almost I assume prevented you being able to break into the NBA because it was like you were playing you know against lower in, in what what's perceived as lower level competitions as opposed to you know playing in in, in Europe and stuff like that do you, do you think that's a fair assessment or no I, I don't think that is because when I went to the summer leagues I had on my business I was going at these boys every year you know it, and when I went to Austria if you look up my stuff in Austria which isn't a great league I absolutely dominate the things I was doing was you know I went to a center role spinning baseline dunking reversing catching it off lobs but I was I, I changed my game to appeal to the Spurs I, everything I did it was like okay I'm not going to shoot these threes I'm not going to I'm going I just want to you know when I went into camp I remember we went into camp summer league and the interns there who every year they move up you know they get a bigger role they were like oh we see you played in in, uh, in Austria you won a championship I was like yeah 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 and, and I was in like probably the best shape I think I've ever been in and I was you know, this is good. they're good highlights to watch. I was, I was, 
you know, a Tyson Chandler-ish type, you know, like bounce. Like, oh yeah, next year maybe you can go like, you know, second division Germany and like work up. And I was like, fuck you lot, man. Like I've just come into camp, I'm ready. And the first thing you tell me is this shit. And I went in there on a, I'm going to eat. I'm going to kill these guys and break every play and dominate Austin Day and Jeff Pendergraph, I think his name was. I just wanted to kill him. You know, I just wanted to, I wasn't trying to be a spur. I was trying to show you, no, 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 no. You know, I'm not going back to, I'm not going to second division Germany. You know, I had the wrong mindset. You know, I didn't have somebody, you know, yeah. you know, you know, like he's an intern. Why are you listening to him, Ryan? Why are you letting him get in your head? You know, and then I went into summer league and I didn't play and I was pissed off, but I stayed in my room every single night. I didn't go out. And in the last game, I had a little poster dunk and I played well against the Mavericks. And then uh, I signed in Dubai. I think that's what happened. I signed in Dubai. And then the same thing happened again. I went to the Spurs the following year. They didn't play me. And I started going out. I thought, well, I might as well go out and enjoy myself. I'm in Vegas. Like, I want to go out and... Like, I'm sick. Everyone's going out, getting drunk, being an idiot, and playing 35 minutes and shooting nine threes. And, and I'm doing the right thing. And then the third year I went, I just said, man... You know, and I had a really good game, actually, against the Bucks. I think I had 18 and five in about nine minutes. So it was never... the op- It was never... You know, I think it was... I didn't listen to them. They wanted to tell me, do this, you know, stay in Switzerland, stay there for a year, whatever, just do it. I didn't have faith or trust in them that if I stay here and average 11 points and five rebounds, as you said, lower level, I'm going to then, one, make a lot of money and two, become a spur. You know, I didn't believe, I didn't have faith in them. And that was because of what I'd been through, but because of, yeah, mainly that, I would say. If you were to go back and kind of give your younger self advice, uh, and try and steer steer him in a in a direction. Would you? Yeah. What would you tell him to do differently? Uh, or would or would you actually say that everything's worked out as meant to have done, and and kind of uh, there are no regrets? There's no regrets for me because I've, I've I've had an amazing life, and I've from where I'm from. You know, a lot of people say oh, where I'm from, but like you know, you've been down to Sittingbourne, and there's nothing. There's no hope. There's no goal. There's no you know. Getting a credit card is that's a goal in life, you know. Getting a Clio, like that's a goal. Like, there's Saxo. There's there's no goals in in that part of Kent, you know. And you know, everyone's doing drugs and getting in trouble and stuff like that. And you know, for me to see what I've seen and done what I've done, like you know, you know, you've got to pat yourself on the back and be proud of what you've done. But then for you to step back and look at all the talent and look at yourself and when you look at NBA guys, you think, nah. He, you know, it's it that is where it's like um oh shit we froze. Oh we froze okay, oh, you okay, yeah. that, <clears throat> that's when I do think sometimes I think, oh you know, oh I could have played and it's not so much for the money. It's not because I think, oh, I could have made fifty, eighty, a hundred million. It's really not and people think, oh yeah. It's the playing in the NBA, you know, hitting a game winner or being a part of the championship team or being a part of that Spurs thirteen team if I wasn't. They're the things that I'll always that they will they will haunt me forever. Not that I didn't make what I should have made or could have made with my talent. It would be as talented as I am. I never got to play on the court. I never got to. Yeah, and then that, and I'll live with that forever. And you know, I'll always have that. But career-wise, you know, where, where I've been, what I've met, I wouldn't change anything. But I definitely would put a team around me. I would have a team around me that travel with me everywhere I go, no matter what. We're riding this out. We've got the talent. We've got the skill. We're going to invest two, three years and we're going to get to the NBA. And I would have done, maybe my mum, my mum would have come to me and a trainer and I would have done something like that. That's the only thing I think I would do if I was younger. Would you say, like, I remember uh, it was probably maybe three years ago now uh, when you were doing the workouts with Daniel James uh, and you were saying that you were, you know, 100% focused on, on, on making the NBA and you still wanted to do it. Yeah. Do you feel like mentally in your head now you've completely closed that chapter uh, or do you still think that there might be a chance that uh, it could work out? Because, you know, there is no doubt that you are an NBA talent. Yeah. You know? um, you yeah. Know. I mean, for me now, it's just stability. You know, I, you know who gave me hope? Brooke Lopez. When I watched Brooke Lopez go from minimum to 50 million for shooting threes, I thought I could do that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it's, it, 
it's one of those ones where, you know, there's so many, like, look at the guys that are on the cover of the NBA and they don't, and there's, poli- the, you know, there's politics and pops. How did pops not have a 20, 30 million dollar career in the NBA? And that's, I'm talking, that back then that was a lot of money, which is still a lot of money, but you know, like the salaries done. Because of injuries or situations or things happen, you know, with the market today, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to the G League and I'm going to lock in and I'm going to, you know, um, try to get a spot. But it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough mountain. You know, there's a lot of politics, youth, there's younger guys. And I have a lot of friends, ex-teammates that are now coaches. And I ask them, they said, there's no question you could play in the NBA. But the younger, the teams that are developing the youth are going to develop the youth. The teams that are in the championship or competing, they're going to sign experience. It, you, you're, it's, you're, it's a tough battle that you're fighting. You going to Belgium and trying to be centre of the year and get some silverware and showing you're healthy and slim and back killing, you know, the money's going to come. But I tell myself, it's not about the money. I don't care so much for the money anymore. You know, I, I, I want to be happy and I'm happy here and, and, and I'm excited to be here. And it's more so that now. But I would love to. I would love to try. But, you know, you need a fair, you know, a fair shot. And uh, But mentally, I could do it. If mentally, if someone said, do this, do that, stay here, do that, I could do it. But I think it's um, Belgium's a good, a good decision for now. Uh, you never count anything out. Anything could happen, can't it? But you've got to put yourself in that position. Like, what's that one big guy um, that's with the Pelicans? I'm really bad with names, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The, the, the British guy. The British oh, Cavell, guy. Cavell. Yeah, Cavell Big Cavell. Williams. Yeah, yeah. You know, I sent him a message. I said, like, I see you working, man. I said, just stay there. Stay there. Just stay there. Be annoying. Be right by him where they have to call yeah. you up. Because it's going to come. He's doing well. and you know. Um, yeah, he's, he's mind, done the same thing sight. very much. He could have earned good money in Europe this season and has, has opted to stay in and sort of do the G League and stay close and to it. Respect to him. You know, if you're around, you know, it, it can come. You know, a call up can come. An opportunity can come. Um, but it's it, that G League life isn't stable. It's not stability. You know, yeah. it's a lot of, and that's not what I'm looking for at the moment. Well, when you talk about sort of uh, finding a home and stability and stuff, I feel like of all the places you've played, um, you know, the teams in Asia really have embraced you, and I still see you know on your socials. Anytime you do anything, there's just all, all of these fans from Iran, yeah, yeah, Tehran, yeah. like coming on and telling you how much they love you and come back and the, the, the yeah, 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 you know yeah. The, the video footage that uh, obviously I've seen from there towards the, when you hit the game winning free and just the atmosphere and the vibe. Like, can you kind of talk yeah. about your experiences playing in in Asia, kind of where you played and kind of how they embraced yeah. you and how you felt at home there? I mean, a lot of people don't know, and I actually got in a fight my first day there because I was like how, you know how do you say pass the ball in Arab you know in Arabic and the guy said yo we're not fucking Arabic you know and I learned quick and you know they're tough hard nosed people they got good hearts the Iranian people the Persian people and the bars where they compete you know they're big they're strong they compete they go hard and we just got on a roll we signed with a I don't know really I'm trying to compare it to an NBA situation maybe we was like the Miami Heat and we got to the final and we, and we nearly got it. We nearly won it all. And Meron shines out, you know, has been huge for me in my career and give me an opportunity this year to go back over there and, you know, rehab and get healthy. And, and it's just the culture, you know, the Persian, the, the Persian culture is just, it's love, it's respect. You know, as long as you give love and respect and they're embracing and they love basketball, they're crazy. They're going to be in the Olympics. My boy, Aaron, big Aaron's going to be over there killing next year. I'm hoping he goes Aaron, to the Aaron CBA. Jer- Jeremy Paul, yeah. I'm hoping he signs in the CBA the following year and I'm just going to rebound for him. <laughs> just be a little, you know, live off him. But no, like, they, I, I, you know, what people show on the news is bullshit. It's nothing like that. I've lived there. I've lived in the north. I've lived in Tehran. I think it's 28 million people in, the, in Tehran. I've lived in the south, um, the Arab Persians. Beautiful food, hospitality. I love it. I love it. Absolutely amazing. They've got their issues, obviously, as a country that I don't really know about. But as far as basketball, well, you know, um, Bahrain, you know, those countries like Bahrain and Dubai and stuff, they're cool, but they're not, they don't have that rich culture as much as somewhere like, you know, the Persians. The, you know, yeah. the Persians. So they are hugely different. Um, I, n- I never realised how big basketball was culturally in, in those parts of Asia until a few years ago I did a freelance gig with, uh, with FIBA covering the Asia Cup. 
And that was mm. just, I mean, the fans, the atmosphere, yeah. the vibe, you know, it was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, you play, was, did you play in Lebanon as well? Played in Lebanon for a little bit. I did play there. Yeah. I was in Iran, um, that year eight, the game when I, I was done, man, I was tired. I was in China. I was in Hungary. I did like, uh, I did like two years, no break. You know, I really, I really, I just went, I didn't have a break. I went from hop to hop to China yeah. to there, to there. Um, actually, that's where I re- got re-injured um, my shoulder, and then I got it fixed two years ago. I kind of played in it. I went to Lebanon. I was absolutely gassed. I was finished. You know, I was done. I I, I was there, you know, for a month. Um, I think I played five, six games. Uh, but it was different out there. You know, it was very social media. You know, Iran, not really big on the social media. It was very. It was Arab. It was the Arab culture. I wasn't used to it. You know, I was. I was more. Um, you know, I was in Iran for three years and. Yeah. You know, I would see women. I would see women in, you know, revealing dresses, and I'd be like, "That's yeah. not normal." Yeah. And then I go to Lebanon, and I'm just like, you know, this is, you know, it was amazing. There's these things that a kid from Kent, how could a kid even from England in general can say he's seen and done things? It's crazy. But Lebanon was Le- Lebanon's probably, I would say, one of the most beautiful countries I've played in, similar to Cyprus and Greece. Lovely, yeah. you know. And I was, was going to say when you talk, like it's funny. I, th- I feel like most players end up carving themselves a career on, on on a specific continent and staying in sort of one area. But when you look mm-hmm. at your career, you've you've literally, you know, you've been in South America, you've been in Mexico. Uh, obviously, yeah. you, you know, you've been in Asia, you've been even all the way around to China. You've been in Europe, like kind of yeah, like, like you're saying that level of experience and that world experience in terms of uh, sort. Of, do you think that sort of being so well travelled? Do you feel like that's partly what's kind of led to you, I guess, mellowing out as you've gotten older? I feel like the level of sort of self-awareness that you have um, yeah. is completely different compared to when you were younger. Uh, and you're just a lot more, you know, you're able to self-reflect, look back on things, mistakes that you've made, admit your faults or whatever, uh, you yeah. know, laugh about your weaknesses. I always remember kind of seeing you at various scrimmages and stuff and you talking about how defense isn't your forte. Or you, or it's not something that you're particularly passionate about or whatever, you know, like... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, like do you when you talk about your own sort of mental development, personal development over the years, what would you sort of directly attribute that to? It's just purely travelling, and it's different cultures. You know, it's going somewhere. You know, I am. You know, I'm from Kent, and you know, I've got a lot of friends from there, and their minds are closed. You know, I've got friends from, you know, all parts of England, and you know, as Brits, you know, the mind is closed. We don't see outside of that, and you know. Um, I get nervous and worried about bringing certain people around different groups because, you know, they can't understand the culture or way. And for me, I mean, you could throw me literally anywhere and I can adapt. And I think that is worth, you know, it's weight in gold. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those ones. I think for me now, I, you know, I've mellowed out, but, you know, when we play, we play. You know, when we work out, we work out. When we compete, we compete. I still never think anyone's going to beat me one-on-one or anyone can hold me or guard me. And I never lose that, even though I'm, you know, original geezer and joker and clown and I'm more relaxed. You know, anyone can see me any time and I'm, you know, ready to go. And I think people still know that, you know, it's a problem. So and that, that's all, you know, that means enough to me. And, and I'm happy. You know, I'm happy and I'm doing well and I'm healthy, man. And, you know, I've changed my body and... You know, life is good, so... But it is traveling. If you don't travel or go in different... You know, I know guys that... I've got a friend, you know, a uh, good friend, Jason Dietrich, and he's like, oh, I've, I've been overseas. It's okay, yeah, you've been in, like, you know, one or two countries. I have other friends, and they're like, oh, I played, I played overseas for, like, nine years. Yeah, one country. So you know your way, and you know that way. You don't know any other ways. So, yeah, it's traveling. I think, if you know, you've traveled yourself, you know, and you can... If you've been in uncomfortable situations... You learn to sit back, observe, read, rather than being the Brits that we are as growing up. As hey, we're it, this this is our part. We're here now. Like, oh, you just sit back and watch sometimes, and and listen and talk less. And truly down to travelling, man. Truly down to travelling. There's nothing more humbling than, than being in a country where you don't know the culture, don't know the language. Literally in the middle of nowhere, you've got no idea what you're doing, and you've just somehow got to work it out. You know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, you have to. Yeah, hundred percent. The so so last couple of things I just want to touch upon. Uh, obviously, BBL. Um, last couple of years, we've seen you most recently with Plymouth, but obviously Surrey as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How you know? How was that experience been for you? I guess it'll be interested to hear your expectations of playing in the BBL compared to the reality of it. Um, mm. Both both on the court and off the court. Uh, yeah. 
and obviously I assume like just how nice it has been to be playing in England as well, seeing as you've been away since you were, you know, 14 years old, 15 years old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like every British basketball player, man, we're always, always complaining. You know, we're always complaining about, oh, it's the BBL, it's been this, it's that. But well, you ain't been anywhere. If you ain't been anywhere, how do you know how bad the BBL is? You know, and I'm telling you, the BBL is not that bad. You know, I've played in some places that, okay, the money's there. Everyone's like, oh, money, money, money. And then they want to be comfortable or have this. The BBL is not that bad. I like, um, I love being at home. I love it. There's a lot of distractions being at home. That's for sure. But, you know, like I said, like I got a you know a real special place for Creon, uh, Henry, Teo, Caelan, all them boys. You know, we, we you know, we, we click and we vibe and it's nice. It's close to my house and Ken. Um, but it's like being around them, you know, and, and they know what they are and they know where they are and they're happy. And Creon only signs good guys, like guys, you know, mentally that are good and good for the team. And that was amazing. And all the London boys were talking shit that day, uh, Christmas Eve. So we had to... You know, shut them up real quick. Uh, but I loved it. Oh, Surrey's been amazing. I love Surrey. I love the Scorchers. I love that. You know, Guildford's nice because it's, it's like an hour away from Kent, but you go all through West Kent to get there. So you've got the nice countryside and Guildford's a nice, you know. Will you say city? Guildford's a city? Um, yeah. I don't I would say town, but I'm not, I don't know. Uh, we don't know. But no, I love it. I love that. Um, so it's always nice to go back and get in the gym with them. Me and Joel had a couple of one-on-ones. Um uh, when I was back there, and it's just good to compete. You know, you got. If you think about it, you got me, you got Joel. Um, you know, you got someone like Creon. Uh, you got Drew. Uh, Matthew comes down. There's a lot of guys in the gym, and you know, we're all in Guildford. You know, like why can't we set that up in in London? Why can't we get that? You know, we need to get that going. But that's great. Plymouth was different. I I went there expecting it to be similar to Creon's way. And how they did it, you know, because that's what I knew. Um, and I think with Plymouth, there's a lot of pieces. There was a lot of stuff going on with the sponsors coming in and stuff like that. And I think they needed the old Ryan a bit. They needed the, the, the dickhead, the guy to say, hey, do this, do that. But because I am so mellowed out now and chilled, I'm not going to make... You can take a horse to warm and make a drink, you know. And I just kind of wanted to fit in as a pro. Like, because I played for so many teams, when I go somewhere, I'm just here to... You know, your, it's your job to run everything, and my piece is what I do, and I do this well, I do that well. So it was it was tough, but I loved it because it it, it actually gave me a good kick in the ass on top of what I was already doing to work out during quarantine and come back next year and really, you know. So because, um, you know, Paul did what he did, and he felt, you know, he wanted to play the way he wanted to play, but I think he had a lot of pressure from the new sponsors, and I think, you know... Um, there was decisions, you know, there was times where I wanted to be in the game at the end of the game, which I couldn't understand why or why the ball wasn't in my hand at the end of the game. And, you know, and also I had a lot of niggly injuries last year and when I was there, but it was different, but I loved it. I loved it. I met some good, good people down there. Martin, great guy, Martin Allen, um, who's helped me a lot financially and figuring out stuff and looking at life after basketball. Uh, all the coaches were amazing. All the staff took care of me. Uh, Will Neighbour was really annoying, never left my house, comes over every day. Uh, but apart from that, man, I love lovely guy. I loved it. I loved Plymouth. It was nice. Southwest. I don't want to say it's better than Kent beaches, but it might be on the same level, man. But no, it's lovely. I love the BBL. I'm always happy to come home. Um, you know, I'm looking to, you know, uh, play overseas and, and yeah. you know, and, and try to play higher levels and, and different and find a home. But I would love to come home and play, you know. I would, I would assume uh, finan- financially, you, you you obviously take a pay cut to play in the BBL. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, Creon he just doesn't respect me at all. Uh, <laughs> no, it's one of those ones, you know. Like with Creon, when I when I um, I was at GB GB uh, Men's, and I, I was coming off my shoulder injury, uh, I was off an ankle injury, off a calf injury. I was just all beat up, man. And I came in, and I just I wasn't me. You know, our first time back with GB after so many years and I wasn't me. And I remember Andrew Lawrence, man, he said, yo, never forget who you are, man. Never forget you are Ryan Richards. Like, keep your confidence. Don't lose your confidence, man. You're out there playing like, not you. Like, come on, man. You know, and I, and I, and I needed that. And then I went down to Surrey straight after because that's that whole group. And it was huge to me. You know, I got to have a really good game against Plymouth and get some really good rhythm. And then I'll oh, back over, back to Bahrain and then back to Mexico and, and yeah, and yeah. So no, I love that whole that whole group down there, man. And, and playing in England is 
In fact, I've never actually played against anyone north ever. We always end up playing in the the London games and the, yeah. the words. And I never got to go to like New. Like I heard Newcastle was amazing. I heard Le- Leicester's great. Um, I like how they play, man. They, I like how they they run. We played them down in Plymouth. They're 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 tough. Um, but yeah, Worcester got to play against Worcester. That was fun. But no, no, no. But I got low, loads of love and respect for the BBL and guys playing the BBL, man. Like you know, play with the hand you dealt. If you're in the BBL, make the most of it. Like work, you know, you know, do what you got to do. You know, yeah. make the most of you're here today, you're here this season, and then try to go somewhere else. Because because you know, with the market, with today's market, if you can say, oh, no one respects the BBL. The market's so bad. It doesn't matter where you're playing anymore. You know, if you're handling business and dominating and getting wins and doing what you're supposed to, you're going to get something. You know, you're going to come across something. So, the other, the other yeah. thing with, with Brexit happening, I mean, that can obviously make a pretty big impact on in terms of bringing some British guys home as well, right? Because the only ones that can be playing abroad are the ones that can essentially compete with the, compete with the Americans. I mean, we all can't be as pretty as Ovi, mate, and go on Love Island, can we? <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> but no, he's. Um, he absolutely smashed it, didn't he, man? Oh, yeah. I hate watching Love Island, but I had to watch every episode. But no, like, <laughs> it's nice to come up. Like, you know, if you can come home, and obviously he's, he's, a, he's the goat. He's, from now on, he's the goat. It's done. But like, you know, it's, um, if you can come home and you can be comfortable. But I think now is the time where I know the BBL got hit financially pretty hard. I'm not too sure what happened with the, the, was it the bailout or something they was, they was hoping to get. Yeah, they was trying. Yeah, they were trying to get some money from the government, a loan from the government, which obviously was directed. Uh, you know, I, financially, I, yeah, I, I, it's going to be tough times for the BBL ahead, especially. Well, I mean, the league's not viable without fans, which is the way that it's got to be at the moment. Um, and I think there's just a hope that by October, that will change. Uh, if it doesn't change, I don't quite yeah. know what they're going to do. I, I don't, I don't see how there's not going to be casualties. I think just yesterday it was announced that Wigan Athletic Football Club have gone into administration. Um, you know, sport is oh, yeah. yeah, sport is hit so hard, and I just, I think the one yeah. I was having a conversation with Paul Blake the other day, and he was just saying, well, the one thing that you know BBL BBL clubs have, BBL owners have, is that they're resilient, right? Unlike other sports, they haven't had everything handed to them. The clubs that exist have done it through, you know, grinding it out, um, and they're survivors. So I'm sure they'll find a way, but I. I think it's going to be potentially very uh, difficult, difficult times ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna ask, like, you know, obviously you're working out with Joel and Surrey. Uh, you know, we've had Luan Pops uh, recently say that uh, they they would be interested in. Uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say no to investing in a BBL club if the opportunity was right. You know, could you ever envision a situation where you know we've got a lot of guys now uh, that are former players or, or or current players that have kind of got a bit of wealth behind them. You could have some type of group that invests in a in a professional franchise in, in in this country to try and really blow the sport up. Could you ever see something like that happen? Is that, is that something you'd be interested in? I mean, I would love to do it, but I would want like full control. That's just <laughs> I just know myself personally. You know, I'd want to run it the way I want to. You know, I, I I think some places, you know, they're built off of like you said, independently they're built and the community and stuff. But if you really want to compete and you really want to play. It depends what your goal is. You know, if your goal is to just keep the ticket and, you know, have a club and, and uh, then, yeah. But, no, if you're really trying to crack Europe and do it the right way, then, you know, you know you're going to need experience. You know, I think if Pops and Deng got involved and someone like Joel, Dan Clark, um, even Kieran, like all these, if, if, you know, if we all got involved in a certain role with a club or an individual club, I think it would help the club yeah. hugely. But it's a thing, you know, I can know how to run something or I can believe something should be run this way. But we, well, we've done this for 20 years. And that's where there's going to be a clash. You know, but if I could run a club or own a club, I would jump on that. I would love that. And I would, you know, probably be the starting point guard. But apart from that, <laughs> I would run it pretty well. No, no, no. But I would, honestly, I would love to. I would absolutely, I would love to do something like that. It would be great. But, um, I think it would be huge because even if, like, even having Joel, even having Joel at Story, it's just huge. You know, like he's helping the guys, he's showing moves, he's he's learning. You know, and, what's and, he and saying at the moment? Because obviously, he, he hasn't even. I don't. He, I'm pretty sure he hasn't formally announced his retirement in any type of way. But obviously, he hasn't played since. Uh... He looks good, man. He, he, he still looks good. Like, Do you think he, there's he, a chance that he could he could start playing again? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think he has to play. You know, yeah. he's definitely taking care of himself 
um, financially, I'm sure. And he's still, oh, yeah, you know, he could he could get in shape and because he's not out of shape, you know. Yeah. And, and he's he's, uh, but I think he's been through a lot too. You know, his story is interesting too. You know, he's he's been through a lot, so it would be purely I could see him playing for maybe his youth team or maybe sorry because he wants to play yeah. but Joel's a competitor he's a competitor man he ain't going to be out there just uh, you know he's going for MVP in the league and to average 20 yards I don't think he's going to be out there just like oh a bit of fun yeah. because he says that when he walks in the gym like yeah but then as soon as the, we start playing a little bit uh, you know the quick quick baseline spin move come out and the little elbow so he, who knows but it's good to see it man it's, it's good to be around the um Ashley comes through as well sometimes, and Matthew yeah. and Drew, and no, it's a great, it's a great area for basketball. So then finally, uh, GB senior men. Um, obviously, we've seen you kind of get back involved over, over the last, last couple of years. You know, is that yeah. something that you want to keep on doing, sort of moving forward? Uh, are you feeling comfortable with the the group of players they've currently got, or you know, are you more focused on yourself and um, kind of doing what you need to do uh, to make sure you're good? I mean, I would love to. You know, for me, I spoke to um, when we was at the at, at the GB camp. I spoke with the coach um, Alonso. Yeah. You know, and he was like, "Man, you know, you, you you know, you get really get in shape. You can be a big part of the offense, big part of the team, and blah blah blah." But I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I wasn't ready. You know, and and when we played, I just felt like we, you know, like we know who the best player is. You know, who the best players are. You know, as far as miles or, you know, as far as whoever we want to run through, you know. And we've got to run through. We've got to support them. You know, all the best teams, like Austria. I love Austria. I've lived in Vienna for many years. Rasheed Malabuch, good friend of mine. Landsberg was in my draft class, you know. You've got two guys, all right? So if you're back, if you've got two guys, then that's your two guys. We're backing them. It's not everyone for them fucking selves. Or let's just, oh, let's see. Or let's run the motion on the offense. Or let's get good shots. No. What's our game? We have athletic, fast pace. We have buckets in the post. We have, again, athleticism. We know what we have. Then use that. Why the, like, not the swear, but why are we trying to do something that's not us? So, you know, for me, for example, if it's, okay, we've got Ryan in the game. Okay, then let's use him. Let's post him up. Let's use him as a six man or let's use him as a, a spark as an offensive plug. That's what Chris Finch did back, all back in them days. That's it. I don't want to be the man. I don't want to play 35 minutes. Use me for me. You know, Gabe, glue guy. Perfect. But who's our guy? Who are we going through? What are we doing? You know, like I watched the Germany game. Loved it. Absolutely. I was so proud of them guys, man. You know, Ben came off big shots. Dan hit big shots. They played amazing. Um, the coach as well. Um, he was really helpful with me when I was there. But I don't know. Is it Mark? Mark Stuhl. The coach. You know, so I just think, it's like, what are we doing? What are they doing? You know, I spoke to Jamie and I said to him, look, I want to be a part of it. I'll fly myself in. I'll put myself up. I'm in shape. I'm ready. I just want to be around the guys. I want to be there. He was like, Meh. I said, okay, well, I'm not going to beg you, you know, if that's the case, mate. So, you know, he goes, maybe the next window. And I said, okay, well, I'm here. You know what I can do? Yeah. Because when we drove back from Cyprus, I remember I, I didn't play. And I wasn't mad about it. I wasn't pissed off. But they felt I was pissed off or mad. You know, I wasn't mad about it. it you know, it was a coach decision. It, you know, it is what it is. Um, but for me, I was saying, like, what are we doing? Like, what's our... Because when I was with GB... Then was the man. Uh, Pops was the man. Like, we knew who the guy was and Arjun was to come and back and support them. Just because of a lot of guys playing the same level, you know, as far as Europe, nah. He's the guy. That's the guy. Or Miles is the guy. Or Ovi's the guy. Or Teddy. Whoever the guy, whoever the guy is, that's the guy we're going to back them. We've got to back them. We all have to play and support them. It's not, oh, well, I'm as good as him or I'm better than him. Or... So I just think, you know, I know Nate from when I was here. I hope they can do something really, really good. Everyone knows what I can bring, you know, and what I can do. And if you want me to bring that or put it into a role, I'd love to be a part of GB again. But, yeah, you know, pick a group, stick with it, ride with it, and find a way. I, I just, I'm just not a believer in, I'm not to disrespect, I'll never disrespect, you know, my country, that, but lower level European countries of basketball, they have one or two guys, right? They have one or two main guys or they have an import or a guy they give a passport and they back him and that's the guy and they everyone else rocks around that, yeah. you know? And the other guys, you know, um, kind of fill in and do their job. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on. If they ever call me, I'm there. Um, I'd love to be around the guys as well. It's fun. But it's an interesting one, man. I don't know what they're doing, but I'm I'm high. I was high, man. I was happy after that game, like the Germany game, and Ben came down to Plymouth 
And I looked like a little fan, man. I don't think we ever actually met. I was like, yo, man, I saw you. And he was like, oh, okay, cheers. So, no, nah, no, nah, I'm excited, man. What's your thoughts on it, though, man? I'm interested. You've about, been about what? GB basketball, like the, 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 you know, I don't know if you can say certain things or something. Well, I mean, kind of I think everybody, everybody knows GB is a mess, right? Uh, but if you was the guy and you had to run it, not players, yeah, like not, I'm going to name who you would pick, but yeah, what would you do if it was? I've said what I would do. I would support two guys, and we all fit in around them, and and that's that. Yeah, well, I mean, you put play, players knowing their roles is a key part of successful teams, isn't it? Like you've got to have people that know their roles and are willing to willing to do them. Um, I think the stuff that you're kind of alluding to is probably more behind the scenes that I wouldn't have insight on because I'm not at practices and kind of a part of the the actual what's being said in 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 uh, in behind closed door settings. Um, yeah, but I think you know the program as a whole administratively is in a mess, is in a, is in a difficult situation, and that doesn't help everything else when it comes yeah. to actually you know trying to help you guys on the floor and stuff. So, uh, you know, I've long said that I I think that having the BBF as a independent, pretty much separate organization from the home nations is a recipe for disaster because there's mm. all these internal politics uh, and they need to be seen as we are the same organization working towards the same goals. And funnily enough, I did a podcast last week looking at the, um, the Madden Review, which was an independent government mandated report that was done in 2007, which was just around when the British Basketball Federation was kind of being set up. And one of the recommendations in that, it was trying to understand why basketball in this country hasn't taken off, why is it a mess, all that kind of stuff. And one of the recommendations in that, it literally says something along the lines of, you know, the British Basketball Federation will not work unless the home nations uh, are seen as to be part of the same organization. Ideally, they all need to work in the same office. It needs to be the same member of staff. You need to have like almost like a shared CEO. So you've got kind of like the boss of the, whether it's the CEO of Basketball England, there's also the CEO of the British Basketball Federation. Then there isn't the us versus them, which is very much like, mm. you know, I'll speak to people on the Basketball England side, they'll talk about GB like it's them. And then GB will talk about Basketball England like it's, it's them. And as a result, there's just this, all this weird stuff that happens and stuff that shouldn't be happening that's really holding the game back. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I struggle to see at the moment with the way things are how it will improve. Uh, there needs to be some big big changes, I think. Um, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, are are things improving? I I don't know if I could say hand on my heart that I believe you know the sport in this country from top to bottom is really getting better on a on a year to year basis. There are certain parts of it that are for yeah. sure, but there are other parts that are very much stale. You know. Um, but yeah, anyway, not meant to be interviewing me. Uh, look, <laughs> Ryan, we, we've been going an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, it's been yeah. flipping awesome, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, I think we should schedule another one in for uh, the next decade, uh, 10 years' time. Let's do it, mate. We, yeah. can, we can look Let's back on kind of what you've achieved in, in the 10 years from uh, now until then. Obviously, you're on an incredible journey. Um, and yeah, congratulations on, on all your success and everything you've done. Uh, I, for one, obviously, I feel very much invested in a big part of your journey. Um, and well, so, that mixtape uh, was huge, mate. That mixtape was... Uh, <laughs> I, couldn't do, I couldn't do all those moves in a one-hour NBA workout. So they, that YouTube mix was... Yeah, unreal, quick, quick, quick 30,000 yeah. views that was back in the day. I was just like, this yeah, is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that was it. But yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed and I really enjoy kind of seeing your progress both on the court and off the court. Like, uh, it's been a, a joy to behold. So yeah, no, nice one. Um, and yeah, stay in touch. Will do, man. Thank you.